similar uh, example than I had in my previous message concerning sheep and coyotes or sheep and wolves. And uh, we are going to have some of that again today. It's a simile that Jesus uses in, in Matthew chapter 10 to, uh, to emphasize a lesson, to emphasize his message. <clears throat> the, uh, the topic of today, I have labeled it this way. We're going to have a topical message saying, living by the wisdom of serpents and being harmless as doves. Now, I don't know if you know what to make out of that. But you already know where I'm taking you in the uh, <clears throat> context, Matthew chapter 10 and in verse 16. Now, I will, I will, uh, we will focus mostly on verse 16, but in order to get a little bit of a broader and perhaps a more appreciative view, we are going to read uh, several verses beyond verse 16 just to help us get the context. <clears throat> Jesus is here, and he's had a good uh, teaching prior to this. I am not totally sure that verse 16 follows right after verse 15. That's not important. But here he comes up, and he has something to say. As I said last, last message, I think it was, <coughs> where, I, where I made that example that if you have coyotes and sheep, the only way for coyotes and sheep to come together peacefully is to convert a coyote to a sheep, and we won't need to go back into that. But today we have something that's actually very similar, but it doesn't speak about converting wolves to sheep, but it speaks about sheep and wolves being together. Now, if you have ever heard of such, tell me, I don't think it works. <coughs> Humanly, scientifically speaking, yet here it is talking about that. And in fact, you and I, we are that sheep, and I just want us to imagine as good as we can that today you take that sheep and you put that in the pan and the wolves are there and there's supposed to be a way that you as a sheep will not get hurt. Now, if you are with me and as we stood on the side of wherever Jesus was talking and he made an example like that, it's either you said, that is a totally ridiculous teaching and perhaps we just scrapped the whole idea. Don't turn off your computer at this point. We're going to learn something here. <clears throat> or you would say, there is something very supernatural about that and I'm eagerly listening. What is it that makes a wolf, a, a sheep, being able to convert or to convince a wolf to become a sheep. Now, that is, in the animal world, is an impossible thing, but there is a lesson behind this that I hope we can catch on. Verse 16, Matthew chapter 10, look at, the, look at your Bible, it says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. It's not that you're somewhere out, somewhere, nope, you're in the midst of the wolves, and then, here's how you will do that. Be ye therefore, and I wish that we would allow this to sink into the depth that it was meant. As I studied, I realized, oh, I'm going to speak to myself again, and I trust that we will all get something, but I sure need this message. I, I sure do. Be ye therefore wise. Now, that's a word we all like. But it says, wise as serpents. Now, don't get shivering right now. Uh, serpents or snakes is something that most of us do not appreciate. And harmless as doves. Now, let's just let that verse sink in. I'll read it again. This is our, our main verse. And we will go on in a, in a little bit. Behold, I send you as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Now, let's keep reading. <coughs> thinking of wisdom, thinking of harmlessness. Now, with that in mind, we got to read the next several verses where, where these wise, harmless individuals. But, oh yeah, that's the word, but beware of man. I, I had to chuckle on this as I thought, okay, it's okay to, go, to be sent among the midst of the wolves and to uh, imagine your sheep are there and they're in the midst of the wolves. That is something that's perhaps even doable based on the concept. But there's a danger. What about if you come into me, among men? But beware of men. Um, that gives us something to think about. Why? Why is among the wolves and, and uh, but when you come to men, we gotta beware. <clears throat> that's a warning that's not given in verse 16. But I think here's something for us to, 
to a catch. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. Pretty straightforward. Not much that needs to be interpreted there. That's easy to understand. This is just going to happen to you. You will be delivered by men. They will take you to the council. They will scourge. Nowadays, we would have a whip, and you will get the whipping. Yes, you'll go home, and you'll have blue and, and dark uh, stripes across your back, and uh, that's just going to happen to you. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings by, for my sake for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. This is becoming, could I say, exciting. Now that might not be the words that you and I would have chosen, but you and I would be brought into the council. We will be in the presence of the king. We will be in the presence of the governor. And those that have brought us in there, you and I will be the testimony against them. There's part of your Christian life that says, ah, that, that would be a good opportunity. And there's part of our carnal mind that says, oh, I please, uh, I, I hope that never happens to me. Uh, there's part of us that would say, you know what, I feel it in me that I don't have what it would take at that moment, but I am convinced that at that moment, God would give me what it would take. I don't know what your feelings are all to that, but this is not to be something that's scary, something that's to be unpleasant. In the context, we don't get that idea, but there is something that we need to understand, that it is wisdom and harmlessness. Okay, let's now, this, this, this is becoming good. We're in verse 19. <clears throat> but when they deliver you up, now I want you to just take a moment. If we all knew that we, and this could become, this could become reality. Many of our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world, they face this in true reality where they are being physic physically dragged into court cases and they have to stand up and they have to testify and many of them have to give, the, give their lives. That is, <clears throat> that is just as normal or it's even more normal in countries, other countries than ours, than this pandemic, as they call it, we are in and having social distancing and, and the reason you're home. That's reality for them. They're being brought in. Now verse 19. Oh, what I was going to say is, so if you, we all knew that this is happening to us, how would we prepare for that? I don't know what you would say, but I was thinking, well, let's get together and, and let's, let's, uh, let's stir wisdom up. Let, how will you do that? How will we do that when we come into the court? What are you supposed to say? What are you supposed not to say? And we would try to become very wise and prepared for that. Now, I'm not scrapping that idea, but it's really not the approach that Jesus is taking. He says, but when they deliver you up, <clears throat> take no thought how or what ye shall speak. I like the words of Jesus. I like when he, when he says things like this. So, uh, didn't we read that we should be wise? Yes, we read that. So, how do we come to this wisdom? And that's the heart. That's my heart for the message. What's the wisdom? For it shall be given you in the same hour that ye shall speak. Can I ask you something? Can you imagine you are standing in the court case, there's the governor, there's the supreme judge or judge, and you are being held to the point. And you have come completely unprepared, like you have given no thought what to say, how to say, you're just there. And the reason is because of your faith. And now you're being put to the challenge, you're being put to testify, and as you testify, you sense that there's a revelation given to you, the Spirit comes into you, and you are being able to speak stuff that you are aware of. It's not coming from your wisdom. It doesn't come from your knowledge. It doesn't come from your education. It's being given to you. As we all ponder that opportunity or that issue or that situation, let's never look at that as a fearful, dreaded thing. 
I can only imagine that if it had to happen, not that I'm praying that it should happen, but if it had to happen and we would go through that experience that everyone, including you, every one of us would step away from it, however the results would turn out, we would step away from that and we say, bless the Lord of my soul. I receive wisdom at the moment I needed it. And that's something that we would all like to have, that experience. And I hope that we can say, well, maybe not to the drastic levels of that, but I am experiencing this wisdom. And you know what? And the beauty of that would be that we would walk away from there and knowing that I was a harmless creature, I was a harmless individual, just like Jesus when he was before Pilate. You know what? I like to, to dwell on the fact that when Jesus stood in the, in the presence of the Sanhedrin and they cursed and accused and, and tried to come up with every possible fault they could find, Jesus in his faultlessness enjoyed the power that was ruling through him being quiet, him being faultless. And you know what? That is you and me. That's the principle. That's what we are to pursue, a faultless Wisdom. Now, just a little bit here. Why did Jesus choose to, to uh, the idea that we should be wise as serpents? What is so wise about serpents? Like I already said, many of us don't even appreciate that animal. We don't. We don't want to take all of all of the the serpents. Uh, meaning the example of a serpent in the Bible is, is most cases very negative, not all the time, but in many cases it is. It's being used in a negative way nowadays. And nobody would like to be called a snake. Some would be okay to be called a dove, but nobody wants to be uh, snaky. And, uh, but the wisdom of a serpent refers, in my understanding, back to the days of, of Garden of Eden where the serpent in its own wisdom was able to sly away or to uh, draw away uh, Adam and Eve from God. Now that was not the recommended thing, but the power in the serpent, that's what you call wise. And then the doves, while well, they were sacrificed in the days when Jesus said that, they all could connect with that. Many of them probably had brought doves to the, to the temple to be sacrificed. A token of peace, a token of harmlessness. <laughs> So, as I said, how can we live by the wisdom of serpents and being harmless as doves? Now, that's a broad subject. I will uh, try to keep it you know, short. Number one, what we understand is that you had sheep and you had wolves. I send you as sheep among the wolves. So there's two definite, very different kingdoms and the sheep are supposed to somehow make it work. Where does this start in our life, in your life? How could I attain that wisdom? Well, I just want to be simple this morning. John 3, verse 3, that is where Nicodemus came to, to Jesus and basically asked the question, what must I do to enter into the kingdom? We have two kingdoms this morning, the sheep and the wolves. I realize I'm in the wolf kingdom what does it take for me to become a sheep? That could be the question the other way around. And Jesus is very simple and he says, verse 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again. That means that old part of you has to die. You have to start over again, born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. That is something that is a must. You know what? That's still the case. You and me, we have to be born again. We cannot just become better people we become different people. We become otherwise minded. Now, if you had a very good upbringing and your parents taught you the good things of life since you were small, you know what? That might not be in your actions and your works might not be much different. But in your mind, you understand that I have now a new birth. I have a, I have a spirit within me. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's corrupt and defiled. Sinful and <clears throat> that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do we realize there's two very distinct, very clear, there's flesh, there's spirit. We are born again people. If we have experienced this, you have a spirit within you. And 
All of God's people have a spirit within them. That's what we receive the day that we were converted. Marvel not that I say unto thee, he must be born again. So there is a spiritual power in the children of God. In other words, among the sheep, there is a spirit of God dwelling in the sheep that the wolves don't have. And so that is what gives the sheep the advantage of the wolf. Physically speaking, yes, no chance. But there's a power within us that gives us a chance. But that power needs to be applied, and that's what we want to look at today. Living by the wisdom of the serpent and being harmless as the doves. As soon as you and I think power, we tend to become minded like the powers of this world. You would like to have political power, perhaps. You would like to have financial powers. You would like to just have the authority, somebody to rule somebody and to say, this is as far as you go, and everybody would have to stop. Just like the policeman. He has the power to stop you on the road. All that it takes, he basically has to raise his hand or flash his light, and you have to stop. It's the power he has. Some of us sometimes feel, oh, if I had that power, I would make use of that All of us, we have some sort of power, human power. You physically might be able to uh, overcome others. Uh, Your words might be big enough, your mouth might be big enough that you can stop or control some people. That way all of us have powers and some of us get confused that we're using that same principle or that same power when it comes to spiritual matters and then the sheep simply grabs the wolf and tries to overcome him in carnal ways, and it does not work. We have a different power. We have a different wisdom. So Romans 12 verse 1 continues on. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies, flesh and bones, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. I like that word, transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That is where the wisdom begins. I am realizing, I am learning what is the perfect, acceptable will of God. And I'm starting to live that. I'm I'm, I'm applying that to my own life. We could keep going in in Romans chapter 6. It it speaks about not yielding our members as instruments of unrighteousness, but to yield them or yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. I like that part, alive from the dead. Dead, we're using a different power. I realize there's a different power and I'm living by that wisdom. I'm living according to the harmless wisdom of this power. I'd like for you to turn to Ephesians 5 and it speaks just another picture of what is happening when you and I step from the one to the other. For ye were sometimes darkness. We can all connect with that. We like to use that power. Some of us, and this is where my challenge is, and this is the part that I need to listen myself and that is, Do you and I always realize when I'm still using that old force, that carnal force, as I approach challenges in life? We will get a little bit more to that in in, in a few moments here. That was part of the past. We have a different approach now. We have a different approach now. Now I'm sending you as sheep among the wolves. That's a completely different concept. There is nobody that says, well, the old way will work. Let's as sheep just get together and bite and chew and claw. No, no, we're, we're different now. It's, it's a different concept. Ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Remember this. That is my heart this morning to remind myself and us all. Do you remember? Has, has your approach, is your approach to the gospel, approach to the kingdom in your own life and then how you bring it out 
Is that very clear that you are now of the light? We are proving, we're stand, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And we have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. I could share too many of these stories of my own life. But as I drive along the road and as I'm thinking about situations, I might be thinking about problems. I might be thinking of, you know what, there could be so much. Then all of a sudden, I catch myself and I realize I am having fellowship with unfruitful thinking. My approach to whatever I'm thinking about is exactly the way the ungodly think. And unless I can quit, I will most likely take a very unwise approach to the challenge. Very, very important. The unfruitful works of darkness that you and I are able to, re to, to catch those little foxes and destroy them before they bring action to our life. <clears throat> What's our focus? Especially important as we think of the wisdom of the serpent and as we think about being harmless. It's very, very much what is the focus of life? What is the intent? What are the intentions? <clears throat> Titus 2 verse 11. I'm using this. We could use other scriptures. But Titus 2 verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. Yeah, it has, it's teaching us. I, that's one of the bigger challenges, and I want to leave that with you. The, the way you approach your situation, is it truly the grace of God where you are right now? Can we say, yes, I'm a weak person, but by the grace of God, I fight. By the grace of God, I approach this. And the Spirit of God can control. It can control my actions. It can control my works. We'll get to that verse in just a little bit. It teaches us, the Spirit of God teaches us, verse 12, that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly. I like that word sober. We could, uh, that's many times in Titus. But the wisdom of the serpent is also a form of s soberness. We can think straight. We can think alert. We think ahead. We know what we're doing. And we know very clearly what we're doing. We know what we're avoiding. <clears throat> Oftentimes, the snake has a way of surprising us. And I know this is mostly in an unpleasant way, but we have spent everything possible to keep them out of the house. And, uh, well, the good thing is that there's not many snakes in this area. But we, some of us know of areas where there is a lot of snakes. And we have done everything possible. We spent money to keep them out of the house. And to your most unpleasant surprise, you come to wherever it is in your house and all of a sudden you realize the snake got there ahead of you as if it was waiting for you. It had it all laid out. Now, well, we don't, don't, we'll go, don't go into all the details of that, but it's just amazing how that works. But you know what? There's a good lesson for us. As Christians, we already know that as we witness and as we communicate to the unbelieving people, we know that it's coming back to us. And we have been wise that when the circle comes around and the people find out your intention, when the covers are being taken off and they see your, your uh, first intention of the matter, you're wise. You were expecting them. And you are not caught by a, a bad deed, but rather the harmlessness of you comes out. And isn't that one of the best experiences when People come back, when non-believing people come back and say, you know what, back in the day, you and I, we had a business deal or we had whatever conversation, whatever it was, and I didn't quite understand, I didn't trust you, but after watching this for a while and coming back for the second time, I realized that you were prepared. I have found no fault in you. And we say, by the grace of God, by the grace of God, we know it. We denied the ungodliness, looking for a blessed hope. <clears throat> Verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. <clears throat> that is my heart this morning with us, that we are a zealous for good works people. 
I want to just briefly touch on this point. We could do this longer, but as the wise and as the harmless people, we have to understand who we are. In every situation, in every approach of life, do you and I understand who we are? I had a conversation, well, I've had a number of conversations in the, in the past year, maybe, of different people. I, you know, as I've said before, I, I learn from uh, talking with people more than reading books. Some of you can read books and learn a lot. Good for you. I read them too, but I always learn more by interacting with people, hearing them out. And what I like to do is people, to hear people out that might not be of our circle, that might not even be believing people. And as the way they look at Christians, the way they look at our specific church, or sometimes it's just church in general, and here's one thing that I have gathered, and that is that it happens that even you and I can make an impression to the non-believing people that watch us with eagle eyes, and we make statements, we take part in conversations, we make expressions that are very, very harmful, and I am convinced that they would not happen if at the moment that we make them, we would remember who am I in the Lord. It's, it's very important that you and I understand our identity. 1 Peter 2 verse 9. But you are a chosen generation. That sheep among the wolves knows for sure I am not one of the wolves. I have a different mission. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. <clears throat> You're bringing out the good news. That's you that's doing that. A holy nation. We are a group of a holy group of people. A peculiar people. We're different that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. That's your identity as we get out of bed every morning, as we start every day. That's who you are if you are a born-again believer. That's why you have the opportunity perhaps tomorrow morning to speak with your friend or your neighbor who's not even a believer, and you will be there to show forth his praise. It's either that or we get sidetracked and we start to speak about the government just like the non-believers do. We speak about finances just like the non-believers do. And all of our wisdom all of a sudden is swept away under our feet and we are caught and we cannot let the light shine. I have several applications for this wisdom and this harmlessness. <clears throat> Applicational. In our business... And this doesn't mean that you need to be a business owner. It doesn't mean that part. It's just in the affairs or in the, in the interactions with money or with business around us. We give absolutely no chance of occasion for stumbling. That means that the deals that you and I make, you know what, it's very often... I buy something from you. I try to sell something to, uh, to you. Whatever the interaction is, as things come to clear light, and many times they might not, but when they come to clear light, you are not being set up for a stumbling because of the deal that I make. It's always entirely honest. It's always open. There's nothing to hide. There's no advantage trying to take. There's no, no, no agenda to push. It is always fair. It's always honest. There's no stumbling. I like that verse. When it comes to our material possessions, we have our material possessions with contentment. Oh, brother and sister, whoever is listening, there is so many of God's people, there's so many of the sheep that have a very, very similar attitude about their, their possessions as the wolves do. And the wolves wonder, where's the wisdom of my godly friend? Why is it that he seems to be just as miserable as what we are? They are looking at you and me. There is supposed to be wisdom. There is supposed to be harmlessness. In our material possessions, we hold them with open hands, not for great gain. Because we understand we brought nothing into the world. We will carry nothing out in this meantime. We're being stewards, and we're, we're just passing through. <clears throat> the next place is in speech. This is the one area that, you know what? We're being watched. 
had a conversation with a good friend here just very recently, and we talked about many things. He sat in my office probably for an hour and a half, and uh, like normal, we talk a lot. As we were talking, I, I got convicted. You know what? We can talk about politics. We can talk about insurance. We can talk about prices, money, world situations, and all of that. And as we were in the conversation, all of a sudden, it struck me, how different am I in all of these opinions than my perhaps non-believing friend? It says, verse, Ephesians 5.25 says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth. Well, you and I, we speak the truth, don't we? With his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. I want us to picture this morning that people know you, and they do. And they know when you will come into the circle. The conversation is probably going to change a little bit according to how you like to have conversations. I know exactly the feeling. It might be, you know, at a coffee table. It might be around after church talk or wherever it is. But I, I see my good friend so or my good friend so is coming. And I know already he's going to very likely bring such and such to the conversation. And I know exactly that it's very often that I kind of wish, oh, if he would come and join this conversation, it would just add. The truth is, too, that some of us know that if so-and-so will come and join the conversation, it's going to turn a little bit to the negative, which we kind of don't like. That is not wise. That's not wise. That's not harmless. Or speech. Good to the use of edifying. There's no evil speaking. <clears throat> Then comes our thought life. What are you and I harboring? Is it wisdom? I had to talk to a few of my employees last week. I had to apologize. As we were talking and as I was thinking about my mistake, I was thinking, how come I made such a mistake as this? Like with all of my heart, I was, <clears throat> I, I, I was sad that this had happened. How could I be brought to something like that? And I'm still praying that the good Lord will do his work. Hey, he needs to do a lot of work in me. But I came to one conclusion, that is that I have been allowing frustration to harbor in my thoughts. Like not real anger as, a, as some people burst out. No, that's by the grace of God, not who I am. And I might feel good about that. That's probably not who you are, and we all feel good about that. But what about that silent frustration and every time the child does that certain thing again, that frustration boils up. And it's actually that frustration that's making you and me speak. That is something we cannot have. We must be alert. We cannot speak out of frustration. Yet things can be very, very frustrating. We have to be able to do away with that. That's not wise. It's in that time where many hurts happen in families, in fellowship circles. Harboring negative thoughts. Harboring criticism. Yeah, you're not known as the verbal outbursting person, but what about the thoughts that we harbor? Philippians 4 verse 8, you know it by memory. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. That's good. We like that. Some of us will fight that verse and say, well, but it's true. I'm thinking about something that is frustrating. There is a problem, and it is probably true. But the way you think about it can still be no virtue. It can still be no good report. We have to develop a very constructive thinking pattern, a very constructive approach. There is no help if the sheep understands the frustration about the wolf, if that's as far as it goes. 
But the sheep has to be able to come to a wisdom, to a grip as to what the real situation is. And it will come around like the serpent did to Eve where the wolf is surprised at the sheep, how the sheep won the race in the thinking. I don't know if you follow that example, but I think there's a very, very, very beautiful picture. The sheep outsmartens, and that's not the word it's, we should use. It, 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 it surpasses in wisdom, and that is the technique of us as Christians. We surpass in wisdom. Now, you remember that you don't get wisdom other than it's given to you. We can become very smart through a lot of education, but wisdom is given. How often have you and I pray, or do we pray simply, God, give me wisdom? In, in our family upbringing, are we wise? In the recreation we choose, whether you eat or drink, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. You know what? That's entertainment, and that in itself is harmless. Whether, therefore, you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Did you get that? With the wisdom of the sheep. Uh, sorry, of the serpent, but it was part of the sheep that need to be wise. It's our appearance. People look at us and they see that we are, we're different. We are different. They might see that at first, but it's not that we just want to be different. We have a focus. We appear different. As man, we're wise. We know we have to be prepared to pray anywhere, any, any time. It's not a surprise when there's a chance that prayer needs to be led, that you as a man, you just jump to the task. There's no such a thing as we say, oh, well, I guess I never thought of that. Or the women, as they adorn their, their inner selves in beauty that surpasses anything that the world will ever offer, something that is so attractive to the world today, an inner beauty that shines. You can tell there's wisdom. You can tell that there is harmlessness. Isn't that ever so beautiful? My heart goes out to every one of us today that we would be a wise and a harmless, powerful people. When Jesus said <clears throat> that we should be as sheep, harmless, Sorry, that we should be as snakes, wise as snakes, harmless as doves. There was a general principle at work. This is how you and I take the gospel to a hostile world. It's not one power against another necessarily. It is two powers, obviously, but it's not like a, a, a confrontational a fight. It is a harmless yet extremely powerful wave that's moving when we become this way. We avoid the snares that are set for us. You and I, there's thousands of snares that are waiting for us as Christians. And if we will be unwise, we will be trapped. There's many, many snares. Yet we can move through all of this and we stay harmless, we stay innocent, because we are serving the Lord blameless. There's a voice in you. There's a voice in me many, many times during our walk that when we see a snare, whether that is just simply, let's just miss family devotion. I don't feel like praying today. I, you know what? I have this frustrating thinking. You know what? My wife does this. My husband does that. And it frustrates me. The children do something and it frustrates me. My coworkers, it frustrates me. You cannot allow that very long until you will find out, oh, you're not blameless anymore. You're not innocent. Let's be on the alert. We are the ones that have the power flowing through us. We're not the ones that have the power. Do you get that? But that power is being trapped by you and me making unwise, foolish choices where all of a sudden the world points right back at you and me and says, look, you're just like us. <clears throat> Let's be the ones, as we have been taught today, that we're wise as the serpent. 
It was there when Adam and Eve came, and I think that's the picture that Jesus had in mind, even though it was straight against himself, but it had it figured out. You and I, with the grace of God, we can have it figured out. We know that we have a future. If I frustrate, if I hurt somebody, it's coming back, and we will get hurt again. If I do it in the right way, every time it comes back, it's a powerful blessing. Let's pray for wisdom. Would you pray with me? Let's pray. Lord, we stand in awe. Yes, in our hearts and minds, we stood with you. We tried to stand with you as you said these words. And Lord, part of us just don't understand. Be sheep among the wolves. What's the chances? I thank you, Jesus, that you gave an answer, that you gave a way. But Lord, we realize this morning that there's so much in us that's going to stir a fight among the uh, wolves. And I realize that that very power that's stirring, that would stir that fight, would just ignite the anger of the wolf and I would be consumed in no time. That's the old flesh. But thank you, Lord Jesus. We also realize that there is a power within us. There is a wisdom within us that has made us, first of all, blameless before you. And it can also make us blameless among the people that we are. But God, this morning we stand before you. I myself in front of the line. And I realize, oh God, there's so much of that old nature wanting to take hold. And where I use that old power rather than the wisdom. Where I use that old way of thinking rather than the transformed way of thinking. God, where I would like to see my name attached instead of your name where I look after the, the, the pleasures of my flesh rather than the glory of God. God, I pray for everyone that is praying with me this morning that you would shake us. Oh God, that you would humble us. And God, that we would become like, wise like the serpent. And most of all, harmless like doves. And oh God, where your power would flow through us and where we would give word for word uh, wise statements that even the world will get attracted to. We ask Jesus that you will walk with us. We need you. We desperately need you. And I pray that that would be the case in all of our lives. Give us wisdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>